if you will. So it's just background. Um, so David was a major contributor. Uh, lots of different people, again, contributed. I'm going to do the next slide that will say thanks. Um, uh, that website below, by the way, is just a temporary website where we're housing webinars and various types of things. Um, some of these talks will be housed there. And um, anyone's welcome to link. Uh, this group has been very, very gracious in sharing data back and forth across state lines and across regions. Um, there are the many thanks. A lot of folks contributed. Um, I see Travis Aarons. Travis, could you stand up? This is the man. These are the on the ground people that actually go out and look at all those aphids on those leaves. And I go out there every once in a while, right? Is that how it works? I would hopefully went there out there enough. Um, but lots of wonderful folks, um, lots of great financial contributors, including the Southern Region IPM, um, an undergraduate program from Del Mar. Um, and then most recently, a, a NEFA crop protection and pest management one, which uh, many of these folks, the PIs, are several of them are involved here. Here's going to be the outline of the presentation. It's just going to be a two-parter. Uh, really, the, the, the whole part of this was originally themed on re, um, regional thresholds, and we did some connective work as we did the standard threshold work to look at IPM potential for the future. So the idea was to look at near-term needs, what's the thresholds, and then what's the perspective for integrating natural minimies and other things. So that's the theme of here, and so I'll start with potential and then go to the regional threshold work. Um, the potential um, for IPM and for sugarcane aphanox sorghum I, I think is great, as Bonnie Pendleton alluded to. Um, um, on the downside, many grain sorghums are excellent hosts. And I probably have short, short changed the, the capacity for increase here. But just physically looking at our plants, our plots, we went from about 50 aphids or less to 500 aphids definitely in less than 10 days. Things happen quickly. Um, a lot of our commercial grain sorghums are excellent hosts. Not all, but many. Plant injuries caused by general plant decline associated with aphid load. Um, no detection of acute plant toxicity, uh, currently known, and no severe disease association, although pote viruses are suspected. Uh, yield loss is due to the plant damage, that just the load of the aphids exhausts the plants, as these pictures show, and harvest disruption. I think um, the previous speakers really spoke to this well, but in brief, um, I do want to say that for the threshold part of this tart, we, f we focused in on, just because of what Mother Nature allowed us to do in the, the locations that we're able to get yield, is that um, when the aphids came in at about vegetative stage, five or six true leaf stage, that's when we first detected the aphids. Everything happens quickly. Everything happens with the capacity of increase here. You could go through a founding colony uh, right here to a few more aphids to a significant aphid explosion in two weeks you could start seeing the sooty mold three to four weeks in the severe problems very bad plant decline um, all is not lost um, as David mentioned and the previous talk that Robert Bowling put together there's been good response in effective use of insecticides um, a little, little maybe less known, not as prominent out there, certainly in the southern part of this range uh, with, with more modest detections further up north, is that there's an, a, um, a great diversity of natural enemies. Ladybugs, four species or so. Green lacewings, parasitoids. Interesting thing on the parasitoids, um, an aphelina species, undescribed is prevalent in the south, um, hasn't been detected much in other parts, but that just be, may be a catch-up issue. I didn't see many parasitoids the first year in 2013, tons of them 2014. 
Unfortunately, they are very active later in plant development. Currently, after economic decisions regarding insecticide use have to be used. But I, I must admit, uh, when we were sampling our aphids post boot stage, all those lace wings, you know, they were just getting in the way. Impressive. And hopefully as we start in, adding in sorghum resistance and using some of these softer chemistries, um, maybe these parasitoids and beetles will be able to catch up and be more part of the picture in suppression. And from an economic sense, earlier in plant development. Promise, as I alluded to, um, David already showed, um, insecticides are here and promising, not large amount of chemistries available, but sufficient. And sorghum resistance is, I would humbly suggest, as Bonnie mentioned, and all these good people are doing, the sky's the limit. There is, some people suggest that this is going to solve the problem. I am willing to say conservatively, this is going to be a very important part of the solution come three, four, five, six, or seven years down the pipe. Um, there are currently some hybrids that are out there that have some degrees of, some people use the loose expression tolerance because the aphids are still present, but there's abundant potential here. Very much in the course line of what Body mentioned with, um, with green bug on sorghum. Same principle, and people are working. Um, IPM potential, safe and effective insecticides. Uh, I won't go into detail, I don't need to. Um, indigo is the, is the product that has Centric in it. Um, Transform, David mentioned, and Savanto mentioned. I just briefly note here that the suppression is excellent. And um, there's a student here that has a poster on the effect of these products to parasitoids and ladybugs. I encourage you to take a look at it. Um, and as David documented, um, chlorpyrifos and dimnepho-8, some, some suppression, maybe, not very good. Um, now to part two of this, the regional thresholds. Please, I'm not going to read this line by line. This is sort of for posterity documentation. If anyone wants to go back and read the details, you may. Um, a couple of our, uh, we have multiple locations. Two of them went all the way to yield. Um, I want to thank um, Mo Wei and Raul Villanueva. Their sites didn't get into yield, but they make yeoman um, efforts. This work is not easy. Um, we were able to go to yield in Corpus Christi and David, um, um, David in Win uh, Winsboro, Louisiana. And here are the results. Yield is important when you want to try to calculate a classic economic threshold. Uh, very standard features here. The aphids arrive, as I mentioned earlier, at five to six leaf stage of plant development, pre-boot, okay? Um, we planted late. Uh, David, I believe you planted late, is that right? A little, a little bit late. So we wanted to make sure, we wanted to hedge our baits. I always like to report to growers that we had something. So um, we planted a little bit late within the planting window, but a little bit late, and it, and it paid off. We got infestations um, at the most sensitive stage of plant development that David alluded to. I would tend to agree with that. So um, we used the um, the spray threshold technique of calculating these thresholds. We did this um, range. We initiated a spray at 50, 100, 250, and 500 aphids per leaf, and had, of course, an untreated control. We used transform, as David talked to. David, we used 14 gallons per acre, and I think you used about the same. Yep, yeah, and, um, and all the details. Um, for us, David mentioned midge, and we also had worms. We just froze our, our, um, our plants. We oversprayed all plots at soft dose stage. And um, to try to freeze in place the yield potential due to aphid activity. The ITN Connect, I'll mention off the bat for this first year, we used hybrids that were susceptible, we known susceptible, courtesy of Bill Rooney and Gary Peterson, and also a, a, a cousin hybrid that had green bug resistance trait in it and planted them as part of the entire mix in a split plot design. Um, that's a setting of our field and on the right, pictures of just the untreated control, um, abundant amount of aphids. We had, if you will, in field, 
vernacular, a good test. And the measurements. We calculated aphid density. I remember the very first second day we went out there, everyone said, this is going to take forever. We got to come up with something. And uh, this is our polished version of what we call the quick aphid checker. It's just a quick categorization, and I can assure you we had good consistency. We had up to four people out there calling off these at a glance, take a look at the, ple uh, at the leaves. If it was 10 aphids or less, the actual count, the breeders really appreciated that. And then we went from categories from there, and the parentheses just so the mid-range of that, the, the middle value of that range, and we did, took an average. And those will give you the details. Uh, we also look at percent leaves with sooty mold as an indicator of potential mechanical harvest problems. That's what we had as an indicator. And then we had yield. We used scissors. We didn't get into the mechanical harvest problems, you know, but we used scissors. So the sooty mold was our surrogate for maybe you're going to have mechanical harvest problems. And then on the IPM Connect, we looked at, um, we couldn't certainly count all the abundance, at least this first year, we wanted to get a feel if there was natural enemies. So, we, so as we looked at our 20 leaves per plot, 10 at the top half, 10 on the bottom half, we, we did a yes or no if there was um, an aphid mummy there, either whole or emerged, didn't matter, and ladybird beetle adults or larvae. My little IPM connect there in the first go, trying to put things together. Um, results? In pictures, I think are good. The top part of the slide is the um, susceptible hybrid. The bottom part is the resistant green bug resistant background hybrid. Um, isolines, other than that, pretty much. Um, when we sprayed at 50, in this particular case, these pictures are coming from Corpus Christi. David has similar ones, I think, except for maybe less natural enemies, I would guess. Yeah. Um, 50 to 100 aphid spray. We had few, few aphids, seven to 14 days after treatment. Absolutely no detection of in, injury, no sooty mold, no yield loss, natural enemies heavily reduced. At, when we didn't spray to an average of 250 aphids per leaf, few aphids again, seven to 14 days, it really knocked those aphids back just fine. Sooty mold was detected, definitely. Not slightly, but it was definitely there. No yield loss, but remember we scissored it. And abundant natural enemies. Um, untreated control and not spraying till 500 aphids per leaf. High aphids that David alluded to. If you wait too long, you just your chemistries just cannot keep up. Your aphids have exploded. They have now exploded. Even when we sprayed at 500 aphids per leaf, the aphids were out of control. Um, keep in mind the plants were bigger, so you didn't get as good as coverage, and they just kept on going. Davage was very visible, tons of sooty mold, great yield loss, and it was a natural enemy zoo. Um, and then enough said really on that. That is for developing an economic threshold. We used all the data coming from the susceptible hybrid. None of the data coming from the resistant hybrid because quite frankly, at out all thresholds from 50 to 100 to 500 aphids per lease. In Corpus, we never sprayed. In Louisiana, they sprayed once, only once. So we chose not to pursue the threshold type work and that we didn't have the data, but we had the need and the data for the susceptible hybrid. Um, and all this is again applicable to when the aphid comes in at the five to six true leaf stage. Um, again, we sprayed once in Corpus Christi, um, and then we would, have to, we would spray again if the animal exceeded the threshold again. It never did in Corpus Christi. It did sometimes in Louisiana. Um, the setup of these bars is the um, susceptible hybrid is the green bar. The green bug resistant hybrid is the pink bar. And the day since insecticide spray in the susceptible is that little number in parentheses. So it gives you the lag time from the spray to when these counts were made. Um, and from action levels, this is the detail. I really went over it in pictures already. From 50 to 250 aphids per leaf resulted in consistently low aphids. For up to two weeks, 
on the susceptible hybrid. Spraying at 500 aphids per leaf resulted in poor aphid control. Here, that's 735 aphids per leaf um, on the 500. In the untreated control, it was only 500 aphids per leaf. It was just big. And then, um, um, excuse me, and that, whoa, I, I apologize here. And then it's just everything was exploded when you got the 500 aphids per leaf. This is, excuse me, that was before spraying. So once we sprayed on the 500, six days after, we only got down to 250 aphids per leaf. Unacceptable. Things are out of control. Everything else from an aphid kill point of view was fine from 50 to 250 aphids per leaf. That's only one parameter of interest, city mold and yield. Um, on city mold, um, again, yield, when we go to 50 to 100, to 100 aphids per leaf, little city mold and, of course, few aphids. So 50 to 100 aphids per leaf on the pink bars, little city mold. If we let it go to 250, plenty of city mold. That is, I'm afraid of that. Um, yield itself on from 50 to 250 aphids per leaf on the peak bars, really good yield. We did use scissors, so any suppression due to the sooty mold um, honeydew buildup we did not detect. At 500 aphids, aphids per leaf, a yield loss problem, and certainly at the untreated control, a yield loss problem. I got, um, so I think we have a good valid data set to calculate a classic economic threshold a la um, Larry Pedigo and others. And here we go. But before we did those calculations, uh, David got yield. We did a side-by-side -side comparison. I think um, uh, we did it independently. And then we shared our pictures. I want to know that, you know, ours, it's not, we didn't, we each calculated these graphs. And look at how close they are. We, we used pink bars and green. That's the only thing we colluded in. Same color coding, amazing. Um, David had a little better separation in the treatments than I did, but very, very similar. The yield loss estimate, estimates for 100 leaf, aphids per leaf, looking at a classic um, um, aphid regression against economic threshold in South Texas, 2.5 bushels per acre leaf yield loss in North Louis, Northern Louisiana, four bushels per acre yield loss. Taking a grand average, you got that. Looking at Larry Pedigo's methods, and I apologize, we haven't, for those of you who are good fans of cumulative aphid days, we've not done that yet, um, but we want to get a first estimate here of what was happening. Um, that, this calculation, you could calculate economic injury level. That is what e EIL is. And then due to a capacity of re-increase for the aphid, we just reduced that level by 30% to get a, a economic threshold. And um, I'm not gonna go into a tremendous amount of detail to, through time. I have everything in the slides if you wanna look at them more closely. But under most conditions, what was very nice to see is that we had a, re a threshold between 50 and 125 aphids per leaf calculated out just, just based upon the cost of one or two sprays and the market value of the grain between $3.50 to $6.50. And what's nice, all that red indicates um, aphid loads that we can actually visually catch. You know, what's nice about this is that people could go out and actually capture 50 aphids per leaf if they go out twice a week. They can actually look at 100. This value isn't five aphids per leaf. This is doable. So this was very exciting. And our best estimate, putting it all in and looking at it, we came up with this regional idea. So do you do 50 or you, do you do 125? Well, here's some information to help you decide. First of all, an IPM connection to sampling we would highly advise using this method, the quick aphid checker, or something else. Maybe the next speaker will solve this riddle for us. Something else, but, you, but if you do percent infested leaves, just for example, if percent 
plants with aphids were used as a trigger for insecticide use. The sprays would have been triggered for all action levels on May 30th. That was a full six days before our June 2nd spray, um, nine days between our June 5th spray, and 13 days before our June 11th spray. So you would have been spraying much earlier, a full week or four in advance on that. Um, I think that relates to what David said about you get a flight in and they're everywhere. So you have to be careful there. Um, for future regional thresholds and future IPM balancing, just one nutshell, I invite you to look at um, Travis Aaron's poster for more information. Um, percent plants with parasitoids, uh, again, 50 to 100 aphids per leaf. Looking at the pink bars, there was, there was not a lot. They weren't statistically different than the other levels. Uh, excuse me, the bottom, bottom one shows a six statistical separation. When you get to spraying at two, 250 aphids per leaf, more, greater percentage of aphids. If we did an abundance of aphids, I think the separation would have been better. So it would be nice from a strict parasitism point of view if you could hold off on the high end of that range. Um, of course, um, you maybe can't hold off given the balance of the ability for this aphid to increase. Parasitism was also detected in the resistant hybrid, which is very nice to see. So balancing, sampling, and IPM. Here's this broad range under most current conditions. It's a big range. I would homely suggest if sampling only once per week under your business ethics, you really need to go on the low side of that range because these aphids are abundant and reproduce heavily. I would really suggest sampling, once you detect the aphid, sampling twice per week. I think it's essential, but if you go once per week, you really need to go on the low side of that economic threshold brain. Twice per week, I really invite you to know what these natural enemies look like. And if you have a natural enemy zoo, hopefully we'll develop to that. You could talk about thinking about looking at more the high side of the range for spraying. Um, that's, we already went over that. So there is your information to deciding what to do. On the summary, I think we have a good case for IPM decision making here. Uh, it attacks a lot of the grain sorghums, reproduces quickly, but no acute toxicity or dis d disease. Natural enemies are present and resistance is promising. A two month window of aphid detection and density estimation is critical. I think we have a decent threshold range, um, and I already talked about the frequency of sampling is really crucial, and I'd humbly suggest estimate densities of the aphid on a per leaf basis. Our thresholds are on a per leaf basis. We think it's doable. Future, a uh, good amount of folks are going to go into um, doing sequential planting times to try to be able to get the aphid when it comes in at vegetative stage as well as boot or later stages to address that um, aphids in the head question. I think um, natural enemy impact for threshold adjustment is, is something to consider as well. And I just want to again thank the, this what I call the on, on the ground team um, of folks really reacting quite nicely and efficiently um, throughout the range. Um, some folks that are interested in doing this type of work go as far east as David Bunting um, in Georgia and up, up Tom's Tomland. And I apologize if I took too much time. I, could you see I'm sort of excited about this project.